What is the most powerful force in the World Wrestling Federation? Is it Hulkamania or is it the power of the warrior? We hope to find the answer to that question at WrestleMania 6, April 1st, 1990 at the Sky Dome, now called the Rogers Center in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This show was nominated by Mike Huey, Ron Schuster, Jeremy Russell, Wesley Landon Woolsey, and Thomas Fireheart over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. Of course, it is the ultimate challenge, Hogan versus Warrior. A lot of firsts taking place at this year's WrestleMania. It's the first WrestleMania with a main event of title versus title. The first one to feature babyface versus babyface. It's also the first international WrestleMania. The first one to take place outside the U.S. It is uh, the first of two Skydome WrestleManias. The second one, of course, being WrestleMania 18, 12 years later. 67,678 people in attendance, including a young Edge and Lance Storm. 560,000 pay-per-view buys for this one, actually down 200,000 from Mania 5. The main event of that course being Hogan versus Savage. The mega powers implode. Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura on commentary. Jesse with an iconic opening sound by here. I've been to the Super Bowl. I've been to the World Series. I've even seen the Rolling Stones, but none can compare to WrestleMania, Gorilla. And speaking of hyperbole, listen to the drama and just the, oh, the oomph in Vincent Mann's voice as he narrates this opening package. Hulk Hogan! And the Ultimate Warrior! Prepare to explode! Champion versus champion, title for title, it's the ultimate challenge, it's WrestleMania! So yeah, Hulk Hogan and the Warrior are constellations now, apparently. Can you imagine any wrestler in today's WWE getting that level of hype and build behind it? Can you imagine someone being compared to a constellation, a collection of stars? Speaking of stars, Robert Goulet sings the Canadian National Anthem. I'm 90% sure some of these sweeping landscape shots have been repurposed for American National Anthems at other WrestleManias. Opening match sees Coco Beware taking on Rick Martel. He is model and this is his first singles match on pay-per-view. Now, early in the previous this year, Martella turned heel, uh, betraying his uh, Strike Force tag team partner Tito Santana. And these guys feuded for the bulk of '89, and Slick was Martel's manager for the bulk of that time. And uh, after all those months of them feuding, by the time WrestleMania rolls around, neither of them are really doing anything substantial. Like they're both on the card tonight, but not really any kind of programs. Near the end of '89, Martel would lose Slick as a manager and become the model. He would have the new perfume, the arrogance spritzer with him, the sweater tied around his neck. Probably one of the more uh, iconic mid card hard angles of the time of the company. And the theme, if you listen to it, is very much like a primordial version of what would become Val Venus's theme many years later. Martel with the jump early on, but Coco outmaneuvers him. Martel dumps Coco out of the ring, inches away from Frankie the Bird. Uh, Martel works over Coco here, big axe handle from the second rope. He goes to the Boston Crab for the first time, but Coco is able to escape with a rope break. Coco makes the comeback in the corner. He fires up, goes for another one of his twisting dives. He hit it earlier in the matchup, but this time he misses. Martel gets the Crab locked in, and Coco submits. Martel wins this opening contest. I give it two stars out of five. It wasn't a bad match, not a great one either. Total good story, but I think had it gone a bit longer, I would have rated it higher because I think that if they had more time to get into another gear, could have been something really interesting. But as it was, uh, the story they told and, and, the, and the work they had here was pretty good. In what's probably Vincent Mann's favorite promo of the night, you got me and Gene Okerlund interviewing the tag team champions Haku and Andre the Giant, the Colossal Connection, or as Gene calls them, the Colostomy Connection. Yeah, there's a fair number of poop jokes and poo-related puns really crammed into this like minute-long promo here. There's a Colostomy to me connection thing. Heenan talks about evacuation. At the end of the promo, Gene says, they're anything but regular guys, then makes a face. And then we see Sean Mooney with Demolition, the challengers. Axe wants to chop down the big redwood and the Polynesian oak. Smash wants to drive him off a cliff in the semi-truck and melt down the remaining metal to make new tag team championships. They don't make promos like this anymore, folks. We go to that match now for the tag titles as the Colossal Connection defend against Demolition. Now, the end of 89, uh, near the tail end of his career, Andre the Giant was uh, paired up with Hawk who 
to form the team. It was a way to kind of protect Andre, minimize the impact he takes in the ring every night, but keeps him kind of relevant and present on programming. By the end of the year, they would beat Demolition to claim the championships, and Demolition, who are at this point two-time tag champs, want to get it for the third time. Jesse says that Andre is bulking up for this match. Sure he is. Demolition gets a huge pop in Toronto for their entrance. Another early jump by the heels on their babyface turnaround. We get a backslide fight between Smash and Haku, but Andre gives a little kick to break it up. It doesn't matter to me if you're some karate, but Haku's karate chop does take Axe down quickly. He ended with a slap to Axe while the referee is distracted. Some double teaming by the champs. Lots of cheating in this one. And the really crazy thing is, Andre sees almost no real action. He'll get involved occasionally with a punch or a kick here and there, but he is almost never tagged in this thing. It's essentially a one-on-one -on -one match between Axe and Haku for the most part. Axe finally gets the boot up on Haku out of the corner with a clothesline. Smash with the hot tag in. Andre does not get tagged in. Smash wrecking Haku in the comeback. Andre finally comes in. Smash decks him. Double clothesline. Axe has the referee distracted. Demolition hit their double team finish on Haku to win the tag titles for a third time becoming the second team in company history to do so. I give it two and a half stars out of five. I give him credit for being able to do a pretty good job masking Andre's limitations in this matchup while keeping things relatively entertaining. Uh, it was essentially, at most, a handicap match between Axe and Smash and Haku with Andre and Bobby Heaton and also to an extent getting a little bit of a mustard in there as well. Heaton on the outside added a little bit extra dimension to this one. So yeah, match kind of in the middle of the road for me. But of course the real big story here is what takes place after the match when Heaton is berating and chewing out Andre in the corner, poking him in the chest. He slaps him in the face. He grabs uh, Bobby by the lapels of his jacket and the pop from the crowd is tremendous here. Andre slaps Heenan in the face a couple of times, gets him out of the ring. And then he basically kicks Heenan and Haku out of the motorized ring cart so Andre can get that really awesome last ride into the sunset. This is his last televised match in the WWF. Goes out as a beloved baby face, kind of going out the same way he basically came in during the expansion. So really touching. A real kind of cool final curtain call for Andre. He would wrestle sporadically internationally after this off of television and he would make some appearances in the last couple of years of his life but this was his last big uh, big spectacle match on air and uh, what a way to go out for Andre backstage mean Gene with earthquake and his manager Jimmy Hart hey baby seismographs Richter scale ha 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 quake's supposed to be doing like an earthquake shaking the ground kind of dance as he's doing his promo it just looks like he has to go to the bathroom really really bad as he's cutting this promo against Hercules also would you believe that's the look of a 27 year old man in earthquake I was shocked when I figured out how old he was in 1990. I've always been flabbergasted how relatively young Earthquake was in his career when he was really in the prime years and as the top or one of the top heels in WWF. I mean, God, he's never looked any younger than 38 in all the years he ever wrestled. Back in November of 89, Earthquake debuted as a fan, supposedly picked out from random by the crowd, but it was all set up by that no good Nick Jimmy Hart to attack the Ultimate Warrior. He did debut on pay per view at the Survivor Series. It's his first WrestleMania matchup against Hercules Hernandez. Hernandez. Hurt goes to put his chain away. Earthquake goes for the jump, but hey, Hercules outsmarts him. What a change in the formula. We get a test of strength here. Hercules looks to overtake Earthquake, but he gets cut off. Herc tries to use his power and strength, but it has no effect on the larger opponent. He's got him wobbling down to a knee finally. He tries to go for a backbreaker, but does not have the strength to do it. Earthquake hits Hercules with the big sit to win, then after the match, hits the big sit yet again. I give it one star out of five. It's not much of a match. I got some serious, like, Kane, Great Cat vibes from Mania 23 from this one, but in my opinion, the story here was told a bit better, which is why it's at a slightly higher rating. I think that it does a great job putting Earthquake over as that dominant guy, beating the other dude who is also, against anyone else, the larger guy in the matchups. I have two giants here. Earthquake asserting his will and his dominance over the other large guy is a great look and really puts Earthquake over in a major way. It's not the last time we see him, though, throughout the course of this night. Rona Barrett's one of the few celebrities on hand for this year's Mania. Now, Barrett Barrett is best known for being a Hollywood gossip columnist from the 60s to the early 90s, and she also was like a big pioneer in the medium that we know now as like in-depth TV interviews with like celebrities and sports figures and stuff like that. But my big question with this was, okay, if Rona Barrett's really known in the Hollywood circle, then why didn't they wait to use her for next year's Mania? in Los Angeles. Bear interviews Miss Elizabeth, who has been seen less and less on TV over the last year or so since the build of Mania 5 when she was kicked to the curb by Randy Savage in that title match build. So where has she been lately? Liz says she doesn't want to disappoint the fans by not helping enough at ringside, and she promises that if she does return to ringside managing, she'll be far more active. Hmm, foreshadowing maybe?
Sean Mooney backstage with Brutus Beefcake. Brother Brutai says Mr. Perfect may have a great win-loss record, but no one's truly perfect, and he will sever that perfect record here tonight. We go to that match now as Beefcake takes on Mr. Perfect with the genius Lanny Poffo at ringside. As mentioned, Mr. Perfect did have a perfect record up to this point. He debuted for TV in September of 88 and had not lost a match since on television. He would lose house shows, but of course, in the world of WWF, TV is all that really counts. And this feud began at the Royal Rumble, when uh, Perfect attacked Brutus following his match with Lanny Poffo, who does actually introduce Perfect to the ring for this one, by the way. Things off to a clunky start in the corner between them, but they're able to recover nicely. I've not seen one opening lockup on the show so far. Perfect is bumping his ass off for Brutus here, but Brother Brutai looks kind of shit here. I hate to rag on him, but I have yet to see a good Brutus Beefcake matchup, as few as there have been in my classic review segment. Though I will give Perfect credit for his bumping ability, this has to be the match that Shawn Michaels studied getting ready for for his match with Hulk Hogan in 2005. Mary Tyler Moore watching at ringside. There's a celebrity for you. Genius with a distraction, slips the scroll into the ring. Perfect Dex Brutai right in the mush, gains the advantage and works over Brutus from there. Vicious kicks the bread basket. Gorilla on commentary says, this thing is turned around 360 degrees here. And Jesse uh, very rightfully calls him out saying, no, it's actually 180 degrees because if it were 360, things would be the exact same. Perfect still on top until Brutus pulls off a double leg takedown out of nowhere. Slingshot into the corner and Perfect's head hits the steel ring post, pinned by Brutus, and he wins, finally snapping Perfect's uh, year and a half long unbeaten streak. I give this one two stars out of five. I think the match, the first part of the match, was kind of rough to watch, but things eventually would recover. Perfect, like I said, very entertaining, but he had his work cut out for him here working with someone like Brutus. It makes Beef Hit look kind of resourceful, but also the recipient of dumb luck at the same time. I don't think it hurts Perfect at all, this accidental bump to the noggin. You know, it's his first loss, but he will recover cover. In a couple months, he'll be the new Intercontinental Champion and things will be hunky-dory for him. So, uh, yeah, it was just kind of a so-so match for me. If Perfect weren't the one wrestling beefcake, it might be a lower rating here. After the match, Brutus wants to strut and cut Perfect's hair, but the genius grabs the shears and tries to sneak away. Brutus catches him, brings him back into the ring, puts him in the sleeper hold as Perfect pieces out, leaves his manager high and dry as the beefer cuts a lot of Poffo's hair, and it turns out he was not really expecting that to happen. It was kind of a surprise to him. We get a recap of the Roddy Piper Bad News Brown feud. At the Royal Rumble, Piper eliminated Brown, and then Brown yanked Piper out in response. They were brawling up the ramp. The fighting continued for weeks, and oh boy, uh, this is it, isn't it? It's uh, Roddy Piper in half blackface. Ooh, lots to unpack with this one. Uh, yeah, he, It took a long time for Piper to finally give like a decent excuse as to why he did this. He said in his autobiography it was like a symbolic gesture of him, like wanting to be a fighter and a champion for people of all races and creeds and colors. Black and white doesn't matter. Even if he had good intentions, just the act of blackface is seen as mostly a negative thing now. Um, not, not just by 2020 standards, but even by 1990, blackface was kind of panned, I would think. Uh, it doesn't help matters that all Piper does in this promo is just insult Bad News Brown's looks, like his bugging out eyes and his big mouth and his dilating nostrils. And here's the thing, if you don't think that blackface is inherently racist or yellow face or brown face or whatever, then I guess a funny little video about wrestling on YouTube isn't going to change your mind, but I just had to get that off my chest. That match is up next, Roddy Piper versus Bad News Brown, and during the entrances, Ventura admits he will not be unbiased in this one because Piper is his tag team partner, so to speak. He's making a reference to the fact that, P that Piper and Ventura recently filmed the pilot episode for Tag Team, a buddy cop show where two wrestlers, uh, out-of-work wrestlers, become police officers. That was a real thing. Never got picked up past the pilot episode, though. If you want to learn more about that, a couple of years ago, I did a live show in LA where I reviewed that episode episode and uh, Rob Fee was there, Steven Larson were there. We had a great time. You can check that episode out right here in the corner. How about this? We finally opened up a match with a lockup tonight, but it does quickly turn into a scrap. A big right hand sends Piper to the mat. Brown has the advantage until he gets a poke to the eye. Piper begins to come back, but Brown rakes the eyes as well. Danny Davis let the lock go here as the referee. Brown removes the turnbuckle pad and immediately it backfires on him. Piper then puts on a white fingerless glove, kind of like an inverted version of Brown's black glove, and we get some more right hands. They brawl on the outside. Piper grabs a chair and goes swinging, but he misses. Right after the swing, though, the bell rings. Danny Davis was counting really fast here. It's a double count out, and uh, the brawl continues all the way back up the ramp as the officials try and fail to pull them apart, which is admittedly a great visual. I give it two stars out of five. I will say uh, the physicality of this was what I really enjoyed about the matchup. It was a great fight of a match, and the story they told was brawling and everything, hither and yon. That was really fun and exciting. It's just too bad the finish was what it
what it was. Apparently, neither guy wanted to lose to the other. They were very adamant about that to the point where this storyline was completely uh, nixed after WrestleMania. It was never followed up on after this. And as far as the half blackface stuff with Piper goes, well, it turned out the joke would be on him because on this night, Andre the Giant and Arnold Skoland, they pulled a rib on old Piper here. They dumped his uh, cleaning solution down the drain and so Piper was not able to actually get the black paint off of his body. It said it took him three weeks to finally get that paint off of him. We go to what's probably my favorite part of the entire show just in terms of pure joy felt here and it's just gag after gag, one liner after one liner and I will give Volkov and Zoom credit because they're able to just keep pace and have great timing with Alan who's so rapid fire in his delivery. It's just a classic bit that just put a real big smile on my face. The Bolsheviks take on the Hart Foundation next. I like the look of Jim and Brett's tights here. Brett's gear is slowly evolving into its final form. Brett giving his sunglasses to a kid at ringside. I didn't know he did this during his time in the Hart Foundation. I assume he just started doing it once he was a singles guy so that's kind of cool to see. Uh, Volkov sings the Russian national anthem but I guess the foundation doesn't want to wait till he gets to Havana Gila. They jump the Bolsheviks, hit the heart attack right away, and win! Okay! I'm gonna give this one one and a half stars out of five, and I'll tell you why. It's on the strength of the Steve Allen bit just before. I'm just gonna lump the Steve Allen thing and this match together into one thread. Uh, some Mania squash, as it turns out, can be fun. We see a promo where they announced WrestleMania 7 at the LA Coliseum. Mm, not quite how that would turn out, though. Afterward, Ventura says LA is his town, the body is coming home. Yeah, he's out the door later this year. Up next, the Barbarian with Bobby Heenan at ringside taking on Tito Santana. Santana's interviewed backstage before the match begins and he says he will survive against the Barbarian. I think he calls Bobby Heenan a rotund manager, but I couldn't quite make it out. And with that rotund manager of his, he's a double threat. Also, I never associated Bobby Heenan with the word rotund. I mean, he was overweight, but I wouldn't call him like rotund. Like when you consider Paul Bear comes to the company about a year later and he's been described as rotund, like that's appropriate use the word. As the match begins, in so many words, Jesse says Chico should have sent Barbarian some Mexican food beforehand because he'd get diarrhea and run off to the bathroom. Santana's able to outpace Barbarian and take him down a couple of occasions early on. Barbarian with a boot that damn near knocks Tito's block off, though. Goes for a rope walk elbow, but he misses. Santana with a big old comeback, the flying forearm. He then puts Barb's foot on the ropes. O'Connor rolled by Tito, but he fucking kills himself hitting the top rope. Flying clothesline by Barb and a hell of a bump by Santana for the win. I give it three stars out of five. You know what? This was not a very long match, but I loved how much action and storytelling was packed into this thing. I think it was a really fun match. It wasn't a squash like the Earthquake match from earlier, and it still got Barbarian over in a really big way. It's actually my favorite match of the night at this point so far. Real hidden gem. We get a recap of the Randy Savage Dusty Rhodes feud to this point. Uh, they brawl at the Royal Rumble during the Brother Love Show. Dusty's manager Sapphire gets involved at the Ultimate Challenge special one week before WrestleMania. Things would continue to get physical. And then we go backstage to see Dusty Rhodes cutting a promo with Thwit That Foul, baby. Dusty hints that he and Sapphire have what the Macho King and Queen Sherry don't. It's the Crown Jewels, baby. And Monsoon goes, I don't know what he meant either, Jess. In the first mixed tag team match in WrestleMania history, you have the Macho King Randy Savage and Sensational Queen. Sherry taking on the American Dream Dusty Rhodes and Sweet Sapphire. This is a first for me. I actually have not watched a whole lot, if any, of Macho King era Randy Savage. I know that the previous year he beat Jim Duggan in a match like for the title of King of the Ring because Duggan beat Haku for it. And so now Macho is the linear uh, King of the Ring, apparently. So he's the. Uh, I love the look, by the way, of Macho's entrance. The gold jacket, the pants, and the design, the color scheme on that. That is a look right there. And of course, Queen Sherry looking regal as always. Venture with the diss of the millennium during Dusty and Sapphire's entrance. They have a combined weight of 465, Gorilla. You're telling me Rhodes weighs 200? Because I know Sapphire weighs two and a half. Oh my God, that is so rude. Rhodes brings out the aforementioned crown jewel. It's Miss Elizabeth looking glamorous as shit and Macho is freaking out. The match begins. Sherry gets a cheap shot early on. Sapphire grabs her hair in response. Great spot where Dusty throws Savage into Sherry and they both fly out of the ring. Sapphire gets it. Another collision on the apron. Then Sapphire actually has to do some stuff in the ring and well it's not entirely graceful but what do you expect on the outside sherry with a cheap shot to dusty great looking shot by the way a couple of bombs away from savage to the outside sapphire tries to stop a third savage hucks her out of the way and jesse is very much an advocate for that because after all sapphire struck savage first king grabs his scepter dives onto dusty's back and hits him from the top rope sherry then dives on a dusty for a pinfall we actually had two count from that which i thought was kind of weird can we please keep the rules of this match consistent dusty beats up savage sherry jumps on top 
top of his back. Sapphire with a snap mare to Sherry off of Dusty. Sapphire then hair mares Sherry out of the ring and Liz throws Sherry back inside. Liz getting physical here. Sapphire with a suplex. Elizabeth attacks Sherry again. Rolled up by Sapphire and she and Dusty win the match. I give it three and a half stars out of five. It's not like an amazing matchup, but it's still very entertaining in its own way. Because here's the thing. This match is way less about Randy Savage and Dusty Rhodes than it is Queen Sherry and Sapphire. And uh, Sapphire is very much not a trained wrestler in any way. It's a really good job of covering up those deficiencies by Sapphire, and it's, it's really entertaining. Liz getting involved near the end, getting physical, nice touch as well. So yeah, this is a really enjoyable matchup. Uh, the feud between Savage and Rhodes would keep going through SummerSlam, but that's a story for another time. Now it's time for what I call the promo gauntlet. Lots of promos back to back to back at this point in the show, beginning with Bobby Heenan, who's acting as if his blow up with Andre the Giant had just happened, but this really confused me because we just saw him a while ago with the Barbarian, and by that point, he was totally collected. But in this promo, he's disheveled, he's sweating like a pig, he's out of breath, he's mad at Andre the Giant. Like, it's, it's, it's out of sequence. If they had switched the promo with the Barbarian match, it would have made a lot more sense, because we'll see Heenan later in the night as well, for like a third time, or at least. And uh, yeah, I thought it was kind of a weird order for that one. We go back to Jesse and Gorilla with Rona Barrett, who says she knows about a sordid piece of film featuring Jesse Ventura, which was a real rumor at the time. She says she's going to roll the film, but then Ventura tosses to Sean Mooney, who's with Macho King and Sherry, and they are pissed. Suffering builds character, yeah! Savage cutting his entire promo, complete stream of consciousness, while Sherry is just running around back in the background, screaming her head off. What an insane scene this is. These two have amazing energy. Then Mean Jeans with the new tag champs, Demolition. Nice promo by Axe here. Kind of humble here. He says that the uh, third tag title victory is the sweetest for him, because unlike the last two times, he and Smash were seen as underdogs. And so they can't even celebrate, he says, though, because the Heart Foundation are breathing down their necks. But he, he does reiterate they will stay tag team champions. Of course, they will add Crush the team later in the year. Hulk Hogan backstage with his famous, this is where the power lies, brother, promo. And he says when he gets Warrior on his knees, he will ask, do you want to live forever? He's basically trying to convert the Warrior and the Little Warriors into the uh, Church of Hulkamania. We then go to the Ultimate Warrior who shoves Mooney out of the shot. You don't deserve to breathe the same air as the Warrior and Hulk Hogan. He then says he wants to take what Hulk Hogan believes in further than ever before, which implies to me that he is an evolved form of Hulk Hogan in this case, like a direct descendant of Hulk Hogan and the teachings of Hulkamania. And it sounds like he wants to bring the Warriors and the Hulkamaniacs together. This is Warrior at his most Warrior. Back to the match as we go as the Orient Express take on the Midnight Rockers. Sean and Marty, they love to wrestle and they love to party. Sean and Marty begin with some fast double team moves. Marty gets dumped out of the ring over the top rope after Fuji pulls down the cane. But back in the ring, a great counter out of the backdrop, landing on his feet before tagging in Michaels. The Express get the advantage. Sato, though, with a really cool, quick spinning headbutt to Michaels who runs at him. Sato rolls off Sean's back. There's a clothesline by Sean and a hot tag. Marty Janetti is a house of fire. Friendly fire by Tanaka on Sato. He gets double drop kicked out of the ring. Fuji on the outside distracts Marty and sets up a sneak attack by Tanaka. Salt in the eyes. Marty has been counted out. I give the match two and a half stars out of five. I'm going to knock the rating down a little bit because of that count out finish. I figured after the big cheating and everything would have been more effective for the heels just to win outright. Get Marty back in the ring, finisher, pinfall, whatever. But we didn't get that here. I will say the action though and the selling and the overall story I did like. Steve Allen's back with Rhythm and Blues. It's the Honky Tonk Man and Greg Valentine who's got his hair dyed jet black looking like Elvis. Not a great uh, era for Craig Valentine at this point. More amazing zingers from Alan, including this little nugget of wisdom. To be perfectly honest, uh, Honky, I haven't been this excited since I found out that uh, Pee Wee Herman was straight. Steve also says they remind him of Elvis. Elvis Costello, that is. Just more brilliance from Steve Allen here, and the play between him and Honky Tonk Man is wonderful. Some I just realized watching this and seeing Rhythm and Blues, like, oh my god, they were that generation's 3MB. Up next, Dino Bravo with Jimmy Hart and Earthquake at ringside, taking on Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Very interesting choice to have a match like this, where it's this uber patriotic, you know, USA versus French Canada kind of thing, when they're in Canada. So Duggan waving around old glory and everything, not getting quite the response you might expect, because he is the babyface in this matchup. Duggan starts out strong, big atomic drop and some corner punches. He charges into the corner, but misses Bravo, running shoulder first into the corner. Bravo takes advantage. Earthquake with a cheap shot when the ref's not looking. Hacksaw in the corner, puts up a knee to stop Dino goes on a run of clotheslines, gets ready for the three-point stance when Quake grabs Duggan. Bravo tries to grab the two-by-four, but Duggan's too fast, decks him with it, and wins. Right afterward, though, Earthquake jumps Duggan, beats him up in a very excessive fashion. Many big sits after the bell rings. I give it one star out of five. The match itself is 
decent, it's pretty forgettable, but the big story is what happens afterward with Earthquake jumping Duggan in the way he did. And I tell you, this two-part thing with Earthquake on the night, between this and the squash against Hercules, does a really good job putting Earthquake over as this massive killer. Because just think about the timing of this, because earlier in the show, you see Andre the Giant riding off into the sunset, the beloved baby face, last match you'll ever see him in. Meanwhile, this show is kind of a coming out party for Earthquake here, really getting him over as the next big menacing giant threat to see what he was able to do with the guys on this night really puts him in that position to be that next mid to upper tier guy, the big giant who can really go with like the main event scene. He would have a big feud with Hogan later this year as well. And so uh, this whole thing with him just killing people left to right at WrestleMania really puts him in a good spot for that. Million dollar championship on the line here as Jacob the Snake of Roberts challenges Ted DiBiase. Now back in May of 89, the previous year, after a match between Roberts and Virgil, DiBiase jumps uh, Jake. He puts him out of the million dollar dream and, he's, and Jake is written off TV for several months as a result of the beatdown. Six months later, DiBiase challenges or he calls out Jake Roberts saying, if you want the championship, come and get it. And after the match, sure enough, Roberts comes in and he uh, steals the championship belt from DiBiase. So even though DiBiase is still technically the champion, Roberts holds the physical belt. So this match is to determine who is the champion after all. Before the match, Jake cuts his iconic wallow in the muck of your own avarice promo saying he will make Ted grovel and beg and be humiliated like Ted had done to so many people over the years. Great stuff. The match begins with some lockups with some blows. Things start off fast. Jake goes for the DDT a couple of times right out the gate, but DiBiase bails. Robert's working over the arm, some big knees to the back of Ted's head. Jake goes for a big knee lift, but DiBiase counters it and Jake eats it. Very similar cutoff to the Jake Rick Rude match at WrestleMania 4, by the way. As DiBiase works over Jake in this matchup, the crowd of the Sky Dome actually start a wave, which is quite a sight to see the crowd get so amped up for the wave with every revolution. The crowd's louder and louder. It's like at one point the loudest, one of the loudest reactions in the entire night, them doing the wave. And you can even see the camera guys like follow it as well and, and the announcers talk about it too. It's so funny to hear that because nowadays you would not hear that. They would not acknowledge that at all. I can't remember the last time I've seen an actual wave during a WWE show, but off the top of my head, the one I remember most vividly is during a match at SummerSlam between JBL and Taker, and that wave was happening, and I know the announcers kayfabe that the entire way through. DiBiase hits a pile driver, which finally shuts the crowd up. He locks in the million dollar dream. Jake's fighting it, falls into the ropes. Crowds are really into the match now and are popping big for every kick out by Roberts. Jake catches DiBiase in midair, makes a big ass comeback. There's a big DDT chant from the fans. Short arm clothesline, but as Jake Jake's getting ready for the DDT. Virgil pulling Jake out of the ring. Virgil pays for it. The Million Dollar Dream is locked back in on the outside. The two collide into the ring post, but Virgil saves his man, throws him back into the ring. Jake counted out, and Ted officially retains his title, gets the belt back. I give it three stars out of five. Now, here's the thing. I thought the match itself was great, and it was exciting. The storytelling was awesome. The action was there. But do we really need another count-out finish at WrestleMania? By my account, that's three on the night so far. Uh, how many people in this company need to be protected that much. After the match, Jake beats up Virgil, who goes flying out of the ring. Then Jake finally drops DiBiase with the DDT. Too little, too late, though. Jake grabs some of Ted's money in the ring, hands it out to some of the fans, even Mary Tyler Moore. Stuffs the money in Ted's own mouth. What a twist. Jake gets out Damien, but Virgil saves DiBiase again, and Jake is chasing with the snake. Backstage, we go to the Doctor of Style, Slick, and friend of the show, Akeem. Slick says that Ted DiBiase has given them thousands of reasons to be judge, jury, and executioner of the big boss man. Akeem says there's two things that don't last long, dogs chasing cars and law enforcement officers who don't take the money. We then go to the boss man who's elsewhere with Mean Gene. Boss man says he doesn't need a manager, a tribal reject for a tag team partner. He's also proud to be an American. Ah! Ah! So that next match is Akeem versus the Big Boss Man. The whole build of this is, of course, the Twin Towers were the largest tag team in the Federation at the time. But then back in February, uh, Ted DiBiase put out a hit on Jake Roberts for the Million Dollar Championship. He hired Slick and the Twin Towers to take care of Roberts. But Big Boss Man, being the noble former law enforcement officer he is, didn't want DiBiase's dirty money. He gave DiBiase back his money. He gave Roberts the belt back. And so now Slick and Akeem want nothing to do with him. Battle of the Big Boys here, but also, more importantly, Battle of the Awesome Theme songs. Hard Times and Jive Soul Bro are just 
timeless classics. Now, I have not talked about Akeem at great length in a very long time on this channel. I think the last time I did really was uh, one of my first episodes ever, Strangest Repackagings. I think I'm a little less outraged about it now than I was. I've mailed out a lot in my old age here on the channel, but I think I'm less mad about it now. It's just, the more I watch it, it's such a goofy gimmick. It's so silly. Uh, you know, I obviously couldn't do this angle today for a lot of reasons. I wonder if they should have done it at all, but at least when you're watching it, it's like seeing Akeem doing the dance and everything. It's just, I don't know, I can't, I can't get mad at it anymore. Before the match even begins though, Ted DiBiase is still there or he returns somehow and he jumps Boss Man and beats him up before throwing him back into the ring. I don't think the bell even rings to start the match, but we're on our way. So corner punches turn into a not great looking inverted atomic drop into a boot. Big comeback by the Boss Man here. Akeem going off the ropes, ducks the elbow, but he gets caught with the Boss Man slam for the big Boss Man to win. Then afterward, Boss Man immediately grabs Slick and gives him a heart punch. This one gets a half star out of five. There's not much to this match. It's pretty short and sweet. The stuff with DiBiase is the real, uh, the real takeaway though with this thing. Uh, it does build a lot of momentum for Boss Man though as he feuds with the Heenan family. And it's also interesting overlap with Ted, by the way. Not very often you see people getting involved in multiple storylines, especially in back-to-back -back segments like this. So yeah, kind of interesting to see DiBiase still getting involved, still trying to get his licks in on the Big Boss Man. Out in the crowd, Sean Mooney interviews fans to see if they're excited about the new hit single from Rhythm and Blues. The first kid he talked to is great. Oh, dude, they can't sing or dance or do anything. Mooney then marks out for Mary Tyler Moore at ringside, chats with her for a bit. He tries to talk with her about Rhythm and Blues, but you can tell she has no idea what he's talking about. I'm sure you have all the Honky Tonk Man's albums. Yes. Okay, and what about his new uh, performance partner, uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine? How about him? And now it's finally time for Rhythm and Blues to debut their new hit single to the world. You got the Honky Tonk Man, the Colonel Jimmy Hart, Greg the Hammer Valentine with the Honky Etts and the Pink Cadillac. And who's that driving that Cadillac? Good God, it's only a young Diamond Dallas Page who actually owned this car. It's a car full of future Hall of Famers. So like I said, they're singing the new single called Hunka 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 Honky Love. And this thing is a fucking train wreck. The whole thing begins, everyone's offbeat for the first part of it. There's tons of feedback, some lyrics are forgotten. Greg Valentine gets a verse you cannot here. He also pretends to play the guitar solo on his acoustic guitar. Uh, what a display. The proceedings are broken up by a pair of guys apparently trying to sell programs, but then wait as Honky says, it's Luke and Butch, the Bushwhackers. Thanks for the exposition. The Whackers chase rhythm and blues out of the ring and they break the bad guy's guitars. This was all pretty darn silly. It was like fun from like a cringeworthy chaos, kind of schadenfreude kind of thing, just how miserable, like that, that cacophony of sound early on. It finally settles in like, and they're on beat after like the second half of it, but ooh, that first part was rough. Rick Rude's in between programs, the ultimate warrior here as he takes on Jimmy Superfly Snooka and Steve Allen joins the commentary team for this one. Rude jumps Snooka from behind as the match begins, but then Jimmy with a quick turnaround. There's that old chestnut. Jimmy mocks Rude with the hip swivel. Jimmy goes very strong for the most part. He goes up to the top rope, but Rude evades. Kind of an awkward transition between the two of them as they set up for a second dive. Rude rolls out of the way, hits the Rude Awakening, and wins the matchup. I give it one star out of five. It is a brief yet athletic matchup, but I'm just tired of the repetitive booking strategies in this show. They, in this match alone, they are using two of the tropes we've already seen multiple times. I'm kind of surprised we didn't see a cannot finish. And now it's finally time for the much lauded main event, the ultimate challenge, title for title, as the world champion Hulk Hogan goes against the intercontinental champion, the ultimate warrior. Hogan won his championship back at WrestleMania five against Randy Savage. The warrior beat Rick Rude at last year's SummerSlam. Back at the Royal Rumble, the two champs faced off for a moment in the Royal Rumble matchup. One week later at Saturday night's main event, the ultimate challenge was thrown down for Mania and accepted. They show some highlights of the build here going into this, like before the match begins. One of which is from that same episode of main event where Hogan and Warrior are jumped from behind by the genius and Mr. Perfect. Hogan gets back in the ring to try and he's like tapping Warrior on the shoulder and Warrior who's in full frantic beat up mode accidentally clotheslines Hogan. But why would Hogan go right to Warrior first if he's got two other guys to beat up? Then the main event in February, Warrior took on Earthquake, but Hogan made the save. Warrior didn't really care for it. Two weeks later, Hogan took on Quake himself. Warrior runs in and jumps Earth. Get a standoff. Seriously, what is with the blocking in some of the storytelling for this feud? We get an epic stare down between Warrior and Hulk Hogan as the match begins. They lock up. They shove each other out of the lockups. These moments alone get some huge reactions. The test of strength. Look at the strength. Look at the muscles. Look at the sweat, Gorilla. Warrior wins at first, and Hogan fights back. We get the famous blowjob-esque image. Hogan with the first takedown. 
They crisscrossed the ropes. Hogan with a slam. Warrior with a slam. Clotheslines him out of the ring. Hogan appears to have hurt his knee on the outside. Warrior takes advantage. We get eye rakes. We get chokes. Things get nasty in a hurry here. Hogan fires up and takes the fight back to Warrior. Our first pinfall attempt results in a two count. Best line of commentary in the night. Hogan has Warrior in a front face lock. And Monsoon says, such a dangerous move. And Jesse Ventura chimes in, yeah, sure it is. Ask Richard Belzer. Hulk Hogan works over Warrior for several minutes, but he fights out of a long chin lock. We get a big old double down after the clotheslines. They each get up. Hulk Hogan goes for some attacks, but Warrior is, I guess you could call it warrioring up. He hits some more clotheslines, puts Hulk Hogan in a bear hug. The arms drop twice, but he gets the arm up for the third one, fights back. Warrior decks referee Hebner mid-run, and he is down. The match keeps going. Lots of opportunities for both guys to win the matchup, but the referee is out of position. Hulk Hogan finally launches Warrior out of the ring. Back inside, Warrior hits the gorilla press and the splash. Now it's Hulk Hogan's turn to Hulk up. The big boot, the leg drop attempt, but Warrior moves, hits the splash. We get the three count. Hogan kicks out three and a half, but the damage is already done. Warrior wins the match and is the new double champion. It is Hulk Hogan's first clean pinfall loss since coming back to the company in 1984 to win the championship off the Iron Sheik. Six years of not taking a single clean pinfall loss. That is some good ass protection there. Hogan grabs his belt and gives it to the warrior, puts him over. The ultimate warrior celebrates in the ring with the big ass pyro and the rope shaking. The sky dome is rocking as we fade to black. I give this one four stars out of five. You know those scenes in Who Framed Roger Rabbit where you've got like Donald and Daffy Duck as dueling pianists and like Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse share screen time together, but the way that the contracts are negotiated between all the sides means that one character can't get over more than the other and they have to be very evenly matched. That's basically what this match was. It was as close and evenly matched as you could possibly, possibly get and still have a definitive winner and loser. The way they booked this thing was like everyone gets a turn, ba -ba boom, and like it's as very, very even at the very end. Uh, you know, credit to Pat Patterson, who's the one who very famously blocked this match, essentially spot for spot. Despite the limitations of Hogan and Warrior, they were able to pull it off and make a really dramatic, captivating match. This is one of probably the more iconic main events in WrestleMania history, and I think it really, in a lot of ways, it holds up. Like, this exact match probably would not fly and not get as over in today's wrestling, unless you had just dynamic personalities like Hogan and Warrior were. Uh, but, man, it's just really... I think the storytelling they have here, these two just colossal beings, these gods, these constellations, as it were, just locking horns and just going move for move, hold for hold with each other, and just, it's really, it's hard to pick a winner. That's why I think this match is so good, because it is so evenly matched, done very well. Like I said, despite their limitations, they really pulled it off. This, of course, was supposed to represent a passing of the torch, the warrior being crowned the new top guy in the company, and Hogan taking a step back. But uh, Hogan apparently told a lot of people backstage he did not believe that Warrior had what it took to carry the ball the way that he himself did all those years before. And whether it be due to his skill in the ring or the booking or any kind of political machinations or just the state of the biz at the time, yeah, Warrior did not get the same opportunities that Hogan did. He did not get that same chance to run for as long, as ungodly of a time as Hogan did. So less than one year later at the Rumble 91, Warrior drops the belt to Sergeant Slaughter and Slaughter then drops it in turn to Hogan at WrestleMania seven and the, the status quo is basically resumed. There's a lot of similarities to Hogan and Warrior, but for whatever reason, Warriors didn't pan out. But I mean, in the long term though, Warrior is still regarded by a lot of people as their favorite wrestlers at the time, still considered an icon in wrestling. Like I said in videos past on this channel, when Hogan became persona non grata in WWE, they just slotted Warrior in that position of like top iconic nostalgic uh, champion of the golden era. So maybe not at the time, Warrior didn't get like the respect that he maybe felt he was owed or didn't get quite that same kind of exposure that Hogan did. But on the back end, you could argue his legacy has just gone up so much more, especially since his passing. But yeah, it was definitely kind of a backloaded level of respect they gave him. My final grade for WrestleMania 6 is a C plus. This show is a lot better than I thought it was going to be going in. Now, ultimately, still a one-match show in the grand scheme of things. It's Hogan, Warrior, and screw off with everything else. And there are some things about this show that I had a bone to pick with, like some of the repetitive booking strategies from match to match. There are some things I would change, but this show still had a fair number of like good matches and also just a, a slew of great moments, like really underrated moments. Like, you know, we talk about WrestleMania moments. It's a primary 
currency in WWE. And this show has an underrated amount of them, like Andre riding off into the sunset. The stuff with Steve Allen is just killer. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, little things in this show that just really still resonate today. And so, yeah, I think it's definitely, it's not, I wouldn't put it in my top 10 manias, list, but I definitely wouldn't put it at the bottom either. It's like somewhere in the creamy middle and it's just like, it's it's got some good, it's got some bad, but there's also a lot, there's a lot of little good things there that really stick with me. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of WrestleMania 6. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Now, next time, it lost the poll a few weeks ago, and I want to do right by the ones who did vote for it, so the next time in this show, we're going way ahead of the timeline, going back to the familiar territory of 2000 era WCW, New Blood Rising, bro. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.